This discussion about boundaries stands alone, but it should also be viewed as a corollary to the dysfunctional family video, the codependent video, and the communication video, because a person can't really be a good communicator without good boundaries. The definition of boundaries is the ability to know where you end and where another person begins. It is also the ability to defend yourself while not offending someone else. Another aspect is the ability to take good care of yourself while not trying to take care of or have responsibility for another. Secondarily, for our purposes, it is fair fighting and conflict resolution. There is no way that a person can have good, healthy boundaries unless they were taught appropriate boundaries at some point in their life, and one cannot teach good boundaries unless they have good boundaries. In order to have good, appropriate boundaries, a person has to know himself or herself. Very often in dysfunctional families, which a number of people come from, people are systematically taught some very crazy rules that make this self-knowledge problematic. These rules are addressed more in the dysfunctional family video. One of these dysfunctional family rules is the idea of being perfect, which is a crazed thought. If a person believes that they have to be perfect, they will become shut off from a very large part of their emotional and intellectual self-knowledge which does not allow for the establishment of healthy boundaries. There is no way a person could have good boundaries if they buy into that particular logic. If a parent feels they and the child have to be perfect, then that parent will systematically disagree and invalidate many aspects and characteristics that the child has that would simply be human. An example is a child who is sick and tells their parents that they feel sick. The child is making a boundary statement. What they're saying is, inside, in my reality, this is going on. I'm sharing it with you, a separate person. If a parent then turns around and says, no, you're not sick, that is crazy making for the child. The child will look inside, they'll look out at the parent, they'll look in, then they'll look at the parent again, and because kids need to feel that parents are always right and that they are solid and powerful so that the child will feel safe, they will assume that they are wrong and bad. The child will take on the blame and assume that their perception is faulty. As a result, a large part of their reality is now dissociated out of their body and out of their awareness and their self-esteem suffers. The effects are even worse than that because they begin to look towards other people to define who they are and what they feel. That is a very fundamental aspect of codependence, and this type of interaction tends to cause this problem. If someone doesn't realize who they are, if they don't have a good sense of reality testing, then they fail to develop the capacity to defend themselves or even to assert their own reality. The result of this type of parenting is learned helplessness. To give an example, about 20 years ago I took up fencing. And because I came from an abusive alcoholic family where I had a very physically abusive father, as a child I learned that he had a right to do things to me but I did not have a right to do anything to him except defend. In fencing, when somebody comes at you with a sword, you are supposed to block it and then immediately repost or stab back. It's called marrying the repost to the parry. It took me several months to change from simply parrying, which I felt comfortable with, to actually taking a physically aggressive action and thrusting because I had developed learned helplessness in this area from my family of origin. At first, children have no boundaries at all. They are egocentric. That means very simply that they are concerned with themselves. If one really looks at the whole idea of being a child, it's a full-time job. Children are terribly vulnerable. They lack mastery in almost everything. 
it would be as if a person had a tremendous case of the flu, which makes their focus go inside until the person feels better. They care about others, but they don't have time to show that. That kind of egocentricity is perfectly understandable. Children are needy. They don't think a lot about other people. And yet, they're human, which means they make mistakes. If parents do not understand this is normal and natural, then the child is not going to develop appropriately. They are going to be blamed for simply being human, and they are not going to be able to develop healthy boundaries. People are often told that immaturity and egocentricity are bad, but they are not. It is just age appropriate. Children need time, attention, and direction. When parents attack a child's neediness, that child learns to hate himself or herself and tries not to need. At that point, they don't develop boundaries, which is simply where one ends off and someone else begins. Instead, they set up walls and erect barricades to keep themselves inside safe and other people out. Walls are not permeable. Walls are permanent, and they tend to enslave people inside. They are not effective boundaries. Parents cannot teach boundaries unless they have them, and they can't have them unless they themselves have been taught. That's how the poisonous pedagogy that we've been educated by for years and years unfortunately continues to cause problems. Very often in dysfunctional families, the idea of simple privacy, of allowing kids' doors to be closed in the family home, is viewed as somehow an affront against the family system. There are very few instances of appropriate boundaries in these types of families. When a child does not have boundaries and has no idea of what normal is, it is very much like a doorway where the door is not there just an empty room. That is essentially what kids in a tremendously dysfunctional family deal with. If somebody says something critical in a shameful manner, it will immediately have an impact on them and wash over them. The child will take it in and tend to believe it. That is an indication of no boundaries whatsoever. They don't realize that they can defend themselves that there just might be the possibility that the other person is wrong about what was said or wrong about the way it was said. As with any problem, there is a continuum of boundary difficulties that people suffer from. If a person has developed a few appropriate boundaries, either in childhood or through therapy, it's as if the doorknob is on the outside of the door so that in general their sense of reality is protected. But if somebody hits a weak or hot button for them, a sensitive area that has not really healed, it's as if the abuser has opened up the door, thrown a bomb in, closed the door, and the person blows up. When the person has developed truly appropriate boundaries, the doorknob is on the inside of the door. That means if somebody says something that seems to make sense, the individual might open the door, really take a look at what has been said, and then decide if the information is appropriate for them or not. If the information is a correct criticism, they will realize the difference between personhood and behavior. Guilt is about behavior. Shame is about personhood they'll only open up to what makes sense. If not, it will bounce off the door and they won't be personally affected by it. That's a good indication of appropriate boundaries. When a person has internalized shame, it is difficult to recognize when another person is attempting to shame them or if it was unintentional. For example, imagine a person walks into a room and they have shoes that haven't been shined. And somebody turns to them and says, well, it looks like it's time for a shine. 
by the tone of voice, it is apparent this time that the person was attempting to shame the other person. But if the person is healthy, it's going to bounce off and not really affect them. They're going to be able to detach and turn to that person and confront them calmly as if they're the one with the problem. It doesn't really impact them. They might say, you know, it sounds like you really are trying to put me down. A person can at times tell by the other person's tone of voice, their facial expressions, and their reply whether they were attempting to shame or not. Based on the reply, a more direct confrontation can be done if needed. Another example is when the motivation of the other person is harder to figure out. Another person says, it looks like it might be time for a shine and the tone is neutral. But what the shame-bound person might well hear is almost the same tone that was said the first time, as if the person was trying to hurt them. When shame is hit, it's as if the entire chest is opened up and the shame-bound person assumes other people can see horrible, nasty things that define them as a person. People so affected either crumble or put up a wall, and then they start throwing back insults of their own. Either way, the shame has taken hold. The only way to completely release shame is for people to admit that they feel shameful, express how they feel, but realize from their adult position that it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with them, that it's a matter of early learning and whatever button somebody hit. Therefore, in the second example, it would be helpful to essentially say the same thing as in the first. I heard what you said, and I wasn't sure if you were trying to shame me or not. Were you? The person should give the other person a chance to say how they feel. If their response seems valid by their bearing and tone of voice, one can assume that they were not intentionally attempting to shame. Unfortunately, when people have poor boundaries, they not only have a problem standing up for themselves, but they often have a problem hearing things correctly. The tendency is to hear it through a veneer of negativity. The shame-bound person will sometimes even add words incorrectly to what was said to them. A third example of feeling shame would be a person walking through a room knowing that his or her shoes need shining and assuming that everyone is looking at and judging them even though no one has said a word. It makes sense to ask a person if they are thinking poorly about you as long as that person is not a professional abuser. If a person does not verbalize how they are feeling and thinking, they often assume the worst. The person will walk away with new evidence that the other people are judging them, and they might be wrong. If a person shares how they are viewing whatever dynamic is occurring, they can get a better sense of how accurate they are by that reality testing. If a person does not say something to get the shame out, it's never going to dissipate. There are internal boundaries for any person that entail setting limits, knowing themselves, and being a good parent to the self. There are external boundaries that are more about setting limits with other people and making sure that abuse does not occur. There is a sexual and physical aspect to external boundaries that are expandable to let people in and out depending on what we want and feel is appropriate at any given time. In other words, boundaries are not rigid. One might want to get closer to some people and further apart from others. There is a physical, even territorial aspect to healthy boundaries. The internal boundaries, according to Pia Melody, an expert in this field, are more emotional, spiritual, and intellectual. They have to do with thinking and feeling about a person's own reality, their definition of themselves, and their point of view. 
Some cultures have much wider boundaries, and some are very, very restrictive. Many boundaries vary between societies. There are some boundaries, though, that are universal, no matter what culture a person comes from. Most cultures would agree that there are very few reasons to allow killing. That is a negative or a taboo in most cultures. But the amount of touching that goes on and with whom is very cultural. Men in some European countries, for example, kiss on the cheek as a greeting. Most Americans would tend to be abhorred by that. The present discussion is going to focus in detail on external boundaries. Unfair or abusive fighting are usually boundary violations. The definition of a boundary violation is the violation of a person's physical or mental state, which is different for every person. Ab use means not useful. Therefore, in the broadest sense, anything that is not useful in human communication may be deemed abuse or abuse. In our culture, we define actions as abusive only if they're physically or sexually uh, abusive in nature. Abuse is just simply not useful. If one is trying to relate to people or trying to get a conflict resolved, then only useful communication techniques should be employed. If two people are having a disagreement about a particular topic and one of them gets abusive, that topic should be put on hold and the abuse needs to be dealt with first in order to reestablish good boundaries before they can go back to that original argument. It is just like a basketball game. If somebody elbows a player in the face, the referee stops the game, a penalty point is assessed, the player then gets a free throw, and then the game resumes. The same applies here. If a person does not stop and deal with the abuse, then the person is allowing and normalizing the other person's behavior. No matter what happens with the original argument, that person won't feel good about themselves, nor will they have a sense of their own reality.